Conservation Conversations. Uh, my name is Ed Pritchard. I'm with Miami Eco Adventures. That's a division of Miami Dade Parks, and we're a co host of this webinar along with UF IFAS Extension and Florida Sea Grant. So it's great to have you guys all here. Um, it's good to see some of our returning participants. And for those that are new, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight for our April Conservation Conversation. We're uh, happy to bring you these monthly webinars. We cover a wide range of topics. And we really have had quite a, a great lineup this spring, including tonight's talk on a beginner's guide to what's why and how's of South Florida native landscaping. Uh, a few housekeeping items um, just before we get started. Everyone in this webinar is currently muted. So I ask that you guys type any questions that you might have as uh, the webinar begins. Um, and you can type those into the chat box. Um, I'll moderate this along with uh, Anna. Uh, we'll answer any questions uh, with our speaker at the end of the session. So we'll definitely have a chance to um, address anything that you guys um, have uh, at the end of the, the presentation. Uh, just as a reminder, this webinar will be recorded and we'll be sending out the link to this recording in the next few days. So feel free to share this with, with others and, and friends that weren't able to join. If you do enjoy these webinars, uh, you can follow us on social media. Um, that's at Miami Eco Adventures and at Miami Dade Sea Grant. And if you'd like to receive an email uh, with a reminder and some of the upcoming topics, um, uh, Anna will put her email in the chat and you can save that and send that request to her. So with that said, um, I'm very excited to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, we have Brian Diaz. Uh, he's the president of the day chapter of the Native Plant Society. And he's a wealth of, of knowledge on our local flora here in South Florida. And I'm really excited to hear his talk tonight. Right, so with that, Brian, take it away. Thank you very much, Ed, and, and thank you everyone for, uh, for being here tonight. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, myself. Um, so just to, to kind of introduce myself a little bit, a little bit more. Um, so, so as Ed mentioned, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of wearing my, my uh, Florida Native Plant Society hat. Uh, I serve as the chapter president for, for our local Miami-Dade chapter. Um, in addition to that, I, I work with the, um, with the Miami-Dade uh, Tree and Forest Resources section with the uh, Natural Forest Community or, or NFC program. Um, before that, I, I did work with uh, Miami Eco Adventures, which, which I must say is a, is a really swell group of, of, of people. Uh, if, if you guys haven't checked out their programming, it, it's both incredibly educational and, and, and super fun. So I, I highly recommend it. Um, a bit of, of my story with, uh, with native plants. Um, so I, I first started learning about native plants after reading a, a book called Bringing Nature Home uh, by Douglas Tallamy, which if you haven't read, I, I very highly recommend that book. Uh, I read that back in 2017. And since then, my mind has just been completely encapsulated around, around uh, native plants and, and their utility. Um, today's talk is going to just kind of be a, a bit of the basics about, about native plants, you know, kind of what they are, what their utility is, as well as the basics of how to, to get started with, uh, with South Florida native landscaping. And although I'll be focusing with South Florida uh, native landscaping, a lot of the concepts that, that, that will be in today's presentation can be applied both to the rest of the state and, and also out of state uh, as well. Um, uh, a lot of, of what I talk about today is going to be drawn from, from just um, things that I've learned and you know, I'm constantly still learning uh, from, from others, um, as well as a lot of just personal experience with, uh, with, with landscaping. Um, and it's a very broad topic, so because I'm, I'm kind of keeping it to the, to the surface level introduction, um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to go in depth uh, with, with a lot of these things. You can spend truly a, a lifetime learning about native plants. Uh, but first and foremost, so we do have a few, uh, a few questions. So it is quiz time. Um, so uh, Anna is moderating a, a poll here, and we have uh, three questions here just to kind of gauge uh, your preliminary uh, knowledge. So if you guys can answer the, the, uh, the, the poll, um, uh, I'll read out the questions for you guys, and we'll give you maybe about a minute, a minute and a half to answer. Uh, so question one. Uh, how many native plant species are there in South Florida? Is it about 500? Is it about 1,000? Is it about 1,500? Or is it about 2,000? Uh, question two, uh, true or false? Landscaping with a small handful of native plant species is just as beneficial for wildlife as landscaping with many species. 
Or in other words, a plant equals a plant equals a plant. It doesn't matter what you put. Um, as long as it's native, it's fine. Um, and then question three, which of the following statements is true? Is it A, most non-native plants benefit wildlife? It's just the invasive ones that are bad. Is it B, if you're going to plant natives at home, it's important to plant the entire property at the same time? Is it C, habitat loss and fragmentation and invasive species are the leading causes of biodiversity loss? Or is it D, humans can still comfortably live without plants around, their main appeal is aesthetic. So I'll give you guys about a minute to, uh, to answer and we'll continue on. All right, well, it seems we have 100% uh, of, uh, of participants um, have answered uh, questions. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see the results or if I share that or if I just keep, uh, keep going on. No, Brian, you can just keep on going. All right, sounds good. We'll revisit these, everyone. All righty. So... Uh, before I go into the nitty gritty of it all, I think it's important to define what a native plant is. It's, it is the, the, the subject of, of my presentation, so it's important to know what we're talking about. Um, so there's, you know, depending on who you ask, you might get a bit of a different definition. You know, certain, certain textbooks, for example, might give a, a, a bit of a different definition for what a native plant is. Um, but in general, um, uh, people define a native plant as a species of plant that has evolved within a certain location, within a certain environment uh, for thousands of years or potentially even longer. Um, and because they've, they've lived in a certain environment for such a long time, uh, they have co-evolved with the rest of the species that you find in the ecosystem and they become functional parts of, of that ecosystem. So, so they, they have lived in tandem with, uh, with all the rest of the plants and animals, uh, and they provide uh, things like resources for pollinators. Um, they, they provide services uh, like carbon sequestration, infiltration, which means um, allowing groundwater, uh, allowing surface water to go into the ground. And they just, they just work in balance with, with everything else. Um, to give an example, if you look at these two photos on the uh, right-hand side of, uh, of the slide, at the very top, you see a plant that you find very commonly in coastal South Florida. And this is a plant called uh, beech nalpaca. Uh, its scientific name is Scovola tacata. Um, and although it's super common, um, you would, you, you know, on first glance, you might think, oh, it's everywhere. It's got to be from around here. Uh, but in fact, this plant is not from around here. It's from the Pacific region, including Hawaii. Uh, and it was brought in. Um, it was brought in from its native range to act as a coastal uh, erosion control. And although it did do its job of, of, you know, kind of maintaining the coast, it grows, it grows very large. So it kind of prevents erosive forces from, from uh, whittling away at the coastline. It, it did its job maybe arguably too well. And it started spreading all around the coast, uh, becoming what's known as an invasive species. So it, it's, it's kind of formed a monoculture. Uh, so you find just just big patches of this plant and just that plant. So it's kind of out competing other native plants. And, 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 and because local wildlife can't really use this plant as well as it can others, it, it, it's kind of just um, a monopolizing area and, and not being a functional part of the ecosystem. But in, in, um, uh, on the flip side, this plant on the bottom is our native Scavola. So this is Scavola plumieri. Uh, which is also called inkberry because it has these uh, jet black um, fruits as opposed to the invasive, which has these snowy white fruits. Uh, and inkberry is much smaller. You know, when you find it in, in the coast, you usually find a few individuals, but you don't see it sprawling around and taking over. Um, and in fact, it is a state threatened species. Uh, so, so it has some conservation um, uh, concern behind it. Uh, so, so 
The second one, Inkberry, our, our, our native Scavola, um, is, is part of the functionality of the ecosystem and it, 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 it's, it's evolved here over a much longer time span. Whereas the, the one above, the beach alpaca, is invasive um, and, and it kind of grows unchecked uh, in the landscape. Um, so our focus is going to be on, on native plants and why we want them around. All right, so let's talk why plants in general benefit the landscape. Uh, so I want to talk about um, something that's called the biophilia hypothesis. Uh, and, and that hypothesis uh, stipulates that, that humans have this, this built-in desire to be around nature and connected with other, uh, with other living things. So in other words, we have, we have ingrained within us um, a desire to be around plants, to have things like birds and butterflies around us, uh, and, and we get this, this, this sense of happiness um, uh, uh, when, when we're around those things. You know, if you think about where people go to vacation, they go to these, you know, lush paradises that you find all over the world, you know. Um, it, and in Confluence, you can think of what happens when you, when you take those things away. If you spend too much time in, a, in the concrete jungle of the city, you know, over time, uh, your mental health might, might take a toll. So being around plants and being around nature is an important thing. Um, and the benefits of, of plants goes, goes beyond that. Uh, we get many benefits from them, uh, from plants in general, uh, in term, you know, in, including things like beautification of the landscape, uh, you know, especially um, at home. That's something that people are, are, are particularly interested in making their landscape uh, beautiful. Um, you can have erosion control, also important for a homeowner. Uh, shade and general temperature control, that's, that's especially relevant when you're talking about the, the shade that, uh, that a tree can give you, especially large trees. Um, in a place like South Florida where it gets so hot, uh, having ample amounts of shade around the building would, would, will, will give you the great benefit of, of, um, of reducing uh, air conditioning costs because of course the trees are intercepting the sunlight that otherwise would heat up the, uh, the building, the interior space of the building. Uh, plants clean air and they clean water, very important. Um, they, they capture carbon, atmospheric carbon. So of course, plants like any other living organism are, are carbon-based um, and, and they're taking in uh, atmospheric CO2 and incorporating it into their tissues, so their roots, their trunks, their leaves, um, including their dead leaves as they fall to the ground and become incorporated to the soil. So in the era of climate change, where we need to remove as much uh, carbon dioxide as possible from the atmosphere, that's a very important one. Um, plants increase property value. I know that that one's a very big thing for, for a lot of people. Uh, in general, the more, the more plants you have in, in a property, uh, the, the higher you can expect that, that property value to be because of these benefits that plants bring to the, to the landscape. Um, and gardening can be used as exercise. You know, it's important to, to move around. You know, we spend too much time at our at our office desk, you know, I know, I know, I do. Um, so I, I, it's important to have that that outlet to 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 go outside and enjoy nature and just get moving a bit. But there is one big caveat that I want to to mention about uh, about having plants in our landscape, and that caveat is that non-native plants offer very little to nothing for native wildlife. Now I want to direct you to this photo on the left. Uh, this this might be a, a, a landscape you find in in uh, in a very nice South Florida home. You have a lot of these lush tropical looking species with tons of color. You know you have pinks and you have purples and you have yellows and you have greens. It's a very vibrant thing and it's something that would that would really capture our attention uh, as people who appreciate aesthetics. But um, although this looks like a very vibrant landscape. I, I'm not noticing anything on here that, that is a Florida native species. Um, and in fact, because none of these plants are, are, uh, are native species, they're not really providing anything for, for wildlife. So uh, a, a bird or a butterfly or a bee uh, might see this landscape and it might as well be you know, bare ground. It might as well just be soil or, or, or grass. They're, they're not gonna be able to, to, to get um, anything from this landscape. And I want to explain why. So the reason why this, this lush landscape isn't providing a lot is, you know, you have to go to the concept of, of whether all plants are created equal. And of course, they are not. 
Um, you know, if you go to the supermarket, you know, a, a good analogy that I like to that I like to mention regularly is that you go to the supermarket, you can find things like spinach, you can find lettuce, you can find different vegetables, different fruits. These are all, of course, plant based foods and they're ones that we that we can definitely eat. So humans are able to eat those foods. Uh, but just because we're able to eat those doesn't mean that we can eat a lot of other plants. So you wouldn't go out into into a forest and pick up a handful of poison ivy and, and think that that's a, that's a wonderful snack. Um, you know, plants are not all created equal. There are differences in, in differences in them, and those differences can be leaf texture, it could be leaf size, but the very big one is the chemical composition of those leaves. The reason why we can eat certain plants and not others is because we can tolerate the, the chemical composition of the fruits and the spinach and the vegetables, but we can't tolerate the, the chemical composition of other plants. And it's the same for wildlife. Um, uh, and that, that, that food chain starts, starts with the insects. So you can, you can think of plants as the very base layer of the food, of the food chain. They're, what, they're, they're the organisms that are taking sunlight uh, and incorporating that energy into, into usable uh, chemical energy in, in, in their tissues. And the first, uh, usually the, the, the first um, uh, a tier of that food web above plants are insects. And because uh, insects evolved with native plants for, for thousands and, and thousands of years, they've had a lot of time to evolutionarily build a, uh, a tolerance to the chemical composition uh, to, to, uh, to a certain plant. So most insects that you find, you know, if you go outside, if you find a bug, um, you know, more likely than not, it's going to be what's known as, as a specialist, meaning it has a very specific food source that it's looking for, and it can't really eat anything else. Uh, that's especially true for butterflies. You know, a lot of, a lot of you might know that, that butterflies have very specific host plants. Um, so if you were to replace this bottom tier of the food web, from native plants, which are usable by, by insects, to one that's non-native, that is not usable by insects, you are severing that first connection within the food web. And then of course, when you sever that connection, it has cascading effects to the rest of the food web. So remove the insects, suddenly the birds have less food, all the little mammals, you know, all these other, all these other critters that, that, that uh, are part of the food web also take a toll, even if they aren't using the plants directly. Um, so you can see that native plants um, uh, have that benefit of, of initiating the functionality of, a, of an ecosystem. And that includes the ecosystems we have at home. Um, these interrelationships, you can see them all over the place. You know, it's not just insects, but you have things like the Florida grasshopper sparrow, which is, the, which is uh, uh, oftentimes cited as the most endangered bird in, in, in the United States. And it, it specializes on grass seeds from a certain few species. You have native bees. You know, there's plenty more bee species in the country than than uh, than than the European honeybee, which is what everyone um, knows and what everyone usually sees. Uh, but different bees have specialized uh, uh, sources of nectar for with different species. I already mentioned uh, butterflies, like the cloudless sulfur caterpillar, which requires plants of the genus Senna uh, in order to to start off its life. You have gopher tortoises, which eat um, many, many dozens of different native plant species, um, and which are very important in spreading the seeds of those native plants. Uh, and you even have marine examples. If you look into our, our local uh, marine ecosystem, you have what's known as the seagrass beds. And although seagrasses might look like algae, they actually are plants. They, they are classified as plants, um, and they're the sole food source for the Florida manatee. So if you remove the seagrass, um, the, the, the manatee won't, won't have uh, uh, any food that, that it could use to survive. And in fact, that's happening today. So you see all these specializations everywhere. They're a very common thing in the ecosystem. And why should we care? Uh, why, why should we care that we're feeding wildlife? You know, we, we seem to be able to live comfortably enough just, just you know, having our landscapes as is and having concrete ev uh, everywhere. Um, but the, the concept I want to draw here is that the functionality of ecosystems on a global scale are what allow life to exist in the first place on the planet, in, including human life. Um, and those ecosystems in turn are, are kept functional 
because of the biodiversity or the number of native species that occur in that area. So you can think of each species. Here I have an example of, of the Everglades. So you can see the Everglades landscape with a lot of the different plants that you might find there. And right above it, you have a, an example of a lot of the, the, the animals that you might see and a few of the plants uh, 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 here as well. And you can think of each of these species as a cog in a machine. So, so each one of these uh, plants and animals has a role in the ecosystem that aids the functionality as a whole. Uh, and when you have a fully functioning ecosystem, you get what's called ecosystem services um, from that ecosystem. And those are, are multitudinal. Uh, you, you can get things like medicines and building materials. You can get uh, recreational opportunities. You can get food or, or the source of new plants that can be used in an agricultural setting. Uh, and, and also uh, functional ecosystems allow the, the, the earth systems to, to continue um, to continue in, in, a, in a kind of stable way. So uh, uh, healthy ecosystems help modulate the climate. Um, they're, they're, they're what's keeping everything sustainable for the rest of life. So, um, so without biodiversity, we lose a lot of these things and, and humans as a result uh, feel the consequences of that. So, so taking care of, of our biodiversity is very important. And there's some very big issues um, uh, with, with our biodiversity, both on a local area, if you want to talk just about South Florida, but also on a global scale. Um, there, there's two main reasons why we're losing species all throughout the, the, the planet. Um, and those two main reasons uh, are biodiversity, uh, uh, that, that drive biodiversity loss, um, are habitat loss and fragmentation. So just the clear cutting of habitat and replacing it with something else. Or, or breaking up remaining habitat into, into uh, smaller pieces that are very disconnected and disjointed from the other, uh, from, from, other, uh, from other remaining fragments and, and might not have um, uh, any interaction between them. Uh, and invasive species. So as I mentioned um, earlier, when I, when I talked about the Scavola example, uh, invasive species are, are non-native plants. So plants that are brought from other parts of, of the world and brought into, a, into an area where they're not naturally found. Um, and because they kind of break free from the checks and balances of the ecosystem, they kind of just start reproducing and popping up all over the place. Um, so here in, in South Florida, we have quite a few invasive species. We have some from Europe, some from Africa, uh, but most of our invasive species are coming either from Asia or from Central and South America. Um, and one example that, that if, you're, if you're joining us uh, today from South Florida, um, uh, one example that you've most definitely seen somewhere is Brazilian pepper, which is this plant that's, uh, that's on the bottom of the, uh, of the slide with the, with the red berries. Uh, so Brazilian pepper was once uh, marketed as Florida holly. It was sold in, in a lot of, of nurseries. It's a, it's, a, it's a South American plant, so you can find it um, in, the, uh, in the Amazon region. Um, and it's a very pretty plant, you know, it has these beautiful red berries, but it, it's just incredibly invasive. Um, you know, nothing eats the leaves of, of Brazilian pepper, you know, nothing local eats the leaves of Brazilian pepper. So it kind of uh, has this unfettered growth. So it, so it can grow unimpeded without any of that, those checks and balances. And it reproduces a lot. So each plant can produce thousands of these berries and, and, and each one um, is very likely to germinate. You know, they have a very high germination rate. Um, but we have we have many many others, um, and on this uh, on this map of of peninsular South Florida, so you have you have Miami uh, right here on the uh, just just midway. Um, you see that that you know if you compare the uh, the right portion, so the coastal part of the peninsula with the Everglades, you see a very stark contrast here. You know, in the Everglades, you have a lot of blues and you have a lot of greens, whereas you see a lot more grays and browns um, along the coast and. And that's, that's the, the Miami metropolitan area, which of course includes Miami-Dade County, but also includes Broward and, and Palm Beach counties. You can see that we've done quite a number on the, uh, on the ecosystems here, you know, where once we found things like sawgrass prairies and mangroves and pine rocklands um, and a lot of different coastal ecosystems, we've, we've largely replaced that with, with our cities, um, with the cities that we have here. Uh, and we, we have definitely experienced really huge losses in our local biodiversity as a result. Um, if you look at all this in a, in a global setting, you know, you have cities popping up all over the world and you have uh, habitat loss and, 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 and invasive species encroachment on a global scale. The result of that has been 
um, estimated destruction of about 77% of our terrestrial uh, ecosystems and 87% of our marine ecosystems. So we've already sustained really large losses and that's translated to uh, over 40,000 species that are now classified um, as, as threatened or, or endangered. Uh, so they're, they're at risk um, uh, of extinction on a global scale. And that 40,000 is very likely to be uh, uh, low-balled because um, the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, hasn't assessed all the species on planet Earth. So it's, it's a dire issue that really needs to be addressed. Um, and our best solution for fixing that, you know, whenever I talk about doom and gloom, I can't talk about it without, without giving some kind of solution. And our best solution is to put nature back where it once was. Um, and you often hear about these large projects, these large eco, uh, ecological restoration uh, projects, like the ones that, that's supposed to be happening um, at Everglades National Park, which is uh, its main goal is to, is to put the ecosystems that used to exist in a certain area, uh, reestablish them and reestablish the connections with the rest of, of, uh, of, the, of the animals that used to, that used to live there. Um, and although you, you usually hear of ecological restoration um, uh, on a broad scale, um, there, there, there are ways that we can engage in, in similar kinds of, of work just, just in our own home landscape. So in these kind of small pockets of habitat that, that we create. Um, I, wanna, I wanna point out this quote from, from uh, Jane Goodall who once said, uh, cumulatively small decision, decisions, choices, actions make a very big difference. So all of us live somewhere, um, whether it's a home or an apartment that has a balcony, you name it, we have to live somewhere. Um, and, and each of those locations is the opportunity to build back a patch of habitat with native plants. Um, and, and nothing is too small, you know, anything from a balcony to a large yard, nothing is too small to, to, uh, to really have some value um, for, for, uh, for our local ecosystems. And I wanna draw on, on the, the example of this butterfly that's pictured here on the right. So this is uh, the Atala butterfly. If you talk to anyone who likes native plants, a lot of the time you'll hear that this is their favorite butterfly. Uh, and for a long time, uh, before I, the 1970s, I believe, um, it was thought that this butterfly was completely extinct. You know, no one had seen it in South Florida for, for a long time. Uh, it, it's, its only host plant is a, is a, 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 a kind of cycad. Um, in fact, North America's only native cycad, which is called the Kunti, um, which uh, historically was, was, very, um, uh, was very much harvested for, for flower production. Um, uh, so much so that, that enough of it was destroyed that, that the Atala's population really plummeted uh, and, and, and they thought that at one point it was extinct. But it was rediscovered again, I believe in the 1970s. Um, and since then, Kunti has become a very popular uh, plant in landscapes. You know, you can find it sold in a lot of stores, um, even ones that don't focus on, on, uh, on native plants per se. Uh, and because they become a, a, a more popular element to the landscape, the, uh, the, 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 the butterfly's population has really, has really jumped back. And there's some places that you can see quite a few of them. Um, if you visit the Miami Beach Botanical Garden, uh, you'll see hundreds there. Uh, and that's because there's so much Kunti in that, in that general area. Um, so this, this shows that reestablishing the native plants, reestablishing the ecosystems can fix the issue. We can reverse this if we, if we have a, a, a concerted effort and we, and we put enough nature back where it's supposed to be. All right, so hopefully uh, I've, I've sold you all on the benefits of native plants and why we need them. And, and hopefully uh, I've got you excited about wanting to put some native plants uh, at home. Uh, I mean, clearly native plants just absolutely rock. Uh, but if you have never done any native landscaping or, uh, or even further, if you've never done any landscaping at all, you might be wondering, where do I start with it? Um, you know, what, what are the steps I need to take to put some native plants at home and what's the best way to go about it? Now, again, a lot of what I'm about to say is drawn from my own personal experience. Um, you know, I've kind of created a series of steps that you might want to take. Other people have their own way of, of doing things. You know, just I'm just giving my, my perspective on it. Um, so the first step that I would recommend is to assess your home's landscape as it is already. Uh, so you might want to ID what plants you have already uh, within the landscape. Um, if you can try and find if you have any natives that are growing, 
whether it's natives growing in the lawn or or maybe you you're 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 lucky and you already have some some native shrubs or some native trees uh, already on your landscape. Um, and this is going to help you make a decision as to what should stay, what should go. Um, not, not all native plants are, are considered, uh, uh, sorry, not all non-native plants are considered bad. You know, not all non-native plants become invasive, um, but all invasive plants come from non-native plants. Uh, so so that's, that's the issue with them. But there are plenty of, um, of what's known as Florida-friendly plants, which are, uh, are non-native plants that are known to, to not encroach uh, into, into ecosystems and become invasive. So you might want to make a decision on you know, whether you want to keep some of those if you already have them. Uh, but I recommend keeping it as native as possible. I always advocate for as many natives as possible. Um, you'll want to learn uh, what kind of soil you have. Um, it, in this uh, middle picture, you know, you have all these different kinds of, uh, of soils throughout Florida, and I'm not even going to attempt to go over them, partly because I'm definitely not an expert on these kinds of soils. But you can get the, the general gist of it. You know, are you working with sandy soil? Are you working with rocky soil, loamy? You know, is there a good amount of organic content? Um, and the reason why that's important is because different native plants um, uh, tolerate different kinds of soil. So some of them, uh, some of them need drier soil, some of them need wetter soils, you know, um, and, and, and you can find uh, uh, different requirements um, on, on, these, uh, on these different factors. So knowing what you're working with is going to be very important. Um, and you also want to see uh, how, how sunlight is distributed in your property. So um, of course, sunlight is, is not distributed evenly. Um, uh, in, in a property, you know, the, the, the sun rises in the east and, and sets in the west in the, in the uh, dry season. So in the fall and winter, the sun hangs uh, closer to the, uh, to, uh, to the south. So you might have shorter days with, with less sunlight. Um, and then you want to look at things like, are there any large trees blocking sunlight? Are there, you know, is there a wall that, that, might, be, uh, that might be affecting, you know, how, how sunlight is distributed at home? Um, and the reason why that's important is because, of course, different plants are going to tolerate different sunlight levels. So some of them might need full sun. Some of them might get away. You, you might be able to get away with planting them in full shade, but it's, it's very dependent on the species. All right. Step two is to establish a set of goals. What is it that you want to achieve with your landscape? Um, are you trying to attract certain kinds of wildlife? Uh, are, uh, do, you, do you value more, um, uh, you know, having rare species? Do you value color? Do you like wildflowers? These are all questions that you want to ask yourself before you get started with a landscape. Um, and these, these, I have these three different modes of landscape, and these are ones that I just kind of created um, on my own that, that kind of, you know, my, my, my goal is to try and encapsulate the general uh, ways that you can go about with native landscaping. Um, so the first way is, is, is a more minimalist or traditional uh, 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 mode of landscaping um, whereby you have the same typical you know, specimen trees or hedges or neat and tidy uh, landscape that you see in, in, in most homes in South Florida, uh, but you're just using native plants for it. You know, if you're going to have a tree um, in, in your front yard or in your backyard, uh, have it be a native tree like this uh, pigeon plum uh, that's that's uh, that's pictured here, which is one of our native uh, trees. Um, or if you want to put a private a privacy hedge, uh, you might want to choose a, a native species. You know, you see um, you see a cocoa plum, which is pictured here on the right uh, of this uh, first mode. Um, you often see cocoa plum used as a hedge, but there's plenty of other species uh, that can be used um, as a hedge too. You know, things like stoppers or uh, or marlberry. Um, so this this first mode is just doing what you otherwise would normally do in your landscape, just choosing native species, and and there's there's definitely great great value in that. Um, you know, even one native plant goes goes a long way in uh, in providing habitat um, for for uh, for local wildlife. Um, but you can take it a step. So in this, uh, in this second mode, you can definitely see that there's more going on here. There's, there's more biodiversity in this landscape, but it's assembled in a way that you might not see in nature. You know, um, in, in nature, you might not see this really tidy, super concentrated, uh, uh, biodiverse collection of, of wildflowers 
Um, uh, but it, it, it might be good for a homeowner that's trying to have these really vibrant aesthetics to their landscape. So they, they want to see all these different, these different colors of, 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 uh, of native, <clears throat> native wildflowers in their, um, in their landscape. Um, now, in general, uh, the more biodiversity you have in, in your landscape, the, uh, the, 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 more, um, the more utility there's going to be for wildlife. And that's, that's, again, that goes to the fact that most, um, uh, most wildlife is specialized on one or a handful of native plants. So if you have more native plants in the landscape, you're bound to attract more species. Um, particularly insects, but also also things uh, things like birds. Um, the third mode of landscaping um, is one where you try to create a pocket of quote unquote restored habitat. And the reason why I have restored in quotation marks is because it might not fit the exact definition of what of what a professional might consider restoration. But the goal is to try and mimic what you see in nature to its best approximation. So it, it, it's trying to bring some, some wilderness back into, into the landscape and might include some plants that aren't very showy that, that you know, you can ask the lay person what they think about it and they might think, and they might say, you know, what's that weed doing there growing out in your landscape? And, and in reality, it's a really rare plant that's just not very opulent. Um, so, so this one, to me is my personal favorite landscaping style. You know, a, a pocket of, of, you know, again, quote unquote, restored habitat can be as big or as small um, as, as, um, uh, as you want. Um, in general, having more space for this mode of landscaping is better just because you can introduce more species and, and you can just have a, you can have a, a greater footprint for that, that, that uh, pocket of habitat. Um, but this is really my favorite because you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that, that nature knows best. Um, you know, nature has kind of formulated itself in very specific orientations uh, uh, over many, many thousands of years. Um, and the best utility for wildlife is, is in my opinion, to, to try and, and, and mimic what, what it does. Um, so I'd like to draw an example of what I have at home. Um, and, and what I have at home is, is I'd say, a an aspiration to the second and third modes of, of, uh, of landscaping. Um, and I have a couple of examples here. So there are a lot of people who would see my landscape and would just be like, what in the world are you doing? Like, did you just like never mow your lawn and just let everything grow? But in fact, that's what I'm trying to achieve with, with the landscape. So um, with this photo on the, uh, on the left, so this is an example of, of my backyard. Uh, I live in Hialeah where, you know, the properties in general aren't very large. So the length of this span here is only maybe about 40, 45 feet. And then the width here is only about maybe 10 to 15 feet. So I'm not working with a lot of land here, but I'm trying to, to the best of my ability, um, recreate a pocket of, of habitat. Um, so here in the back, I'm, I'm trying to, to recreate what's known as a, as a hammock ecosystem. So a hammock is basically... Um, a local type of hardwood forest that you have here in South Florida. So I have things like firebush and coral beans and wild lime, which attracts, uh, which attracts the uh, giant swallowtail butterflies and Simpson stoppers, beauty berries, privets, uh, willow bustics, false mastics, you know, and I don't shy away from these understory plants. You know, I have rougeberry here. I have, um, I have Boston fern over here in the corner. My goal is to have these different these different uh, elements of a forest in miniature. Um, and I've, I've seen some, some, you know, really interesting wildlife that I'll mention in, in a moment come to my yard as a result of this. So I kind of, I, I kind of really love this, this reintegration of wildness um, in a place that, you know, four years ago, all this was just lawn. You know, we never had a single plant in the backyard and I've, 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 built, I've built this from the ground up. Um, here on the right is the front, you know, one of the planters that I have in the front of my house. And this isn't really anything that you'd see in nature, you know, because it's such a small space. Um, I've kind of just put whatever native plants I found, you know, things that, that kind of work well together. Um, so it's, it's not like you would find, you know, these different species so close together in a native, uh, in, in, a, in a natural setting. Um, but but I've, I've still, 
um, I've still seen plenty of different uh, uh, species come to to um, uh, to this front of my landscape. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, even one plant is is uh, is a good thing. So uh, there's a saying, you know, plant it and they will come. So it, although I try to approximate nature to the best of my ability, that definitely doesn't mean that that's the only way that you're going to get nature. Um, just having native plants in your landscape is going to go a long way. And because I put plants uh, in my yard, um, I have a, about 90 to 95 different species of native plants growing in my, my small little patch of land that I'm working with here. But I've seen such incredible wildlife come, come to, uh, to, my, uh, to my house over the years. You know, things that, you know, growing up, I've never seen. I've, I've lived here for, for my entire life, you know, since I was a baby. And, and, you know, we just never saw things like the giant swallowtail butterfly, largest butterfly species in North America. Um, I've never seen before uh, these black-throated blue warblers, which um, which like to migrate, uh, which which migrate here in the fall. So I took this picture in October of last year. I was super surprised when I saw this um, in in my yard. I've seen things like raccoons, which you know, although a lot of people you know find them scary, whenever I see a raccoon, I'm like, yes, please, like stay. the The yard's yours. And I never used to see them growing up before I planted plants. I've seen things like this. Um, uh, this Iowa moth, which likes to, which whose caterpillars like to eat cocoa plum, which I uh, recently planted last year, and ever since planting it, I, I I saw I saw this very beautiful moth. So, if it wasn't for these plants that I've established here, I, I really don't think I would ever see uh, these these uh, this wildlife around. Um, so that's that's the really the great benefit of it all. Um, so step three, you want to put a, a good amount of research into the plants that you might want to um, to to uh, to put at home. Um, there are plenty of resources that, that you can use to research. Uh, I have a slide at the end of the presentation that has a few more that you can reference. But my favorite of them all is the Institute for Regional Conservation. Um, they have uh, the Floristic Inventory of South Florida, which is basically just all the plants that you might find that you might find uh, in, in South Florida, uh, and they, they list them by conservation area. Um, but they also have this part of their website called Natives for Your Neighborhood. And if you go to that part of the website, you will be taken to this page uh, here that you find on the bottom left that asks you to enter your zip code. Uh, and once you enter your zip code, it takes you to another page that, that uh, tells you what habitats, what kinds of ecosystems you might have historically found in your specific area. Um, so here in Hialeah, you know, if I put if I put um, if I put my zip code, I would get things uh, like like swamp or prairie hammock or Morro prairie, things like that. Um, and you can also click on uh, the link that says uh, uh, get your plant list for whatever zip code you put in, um, and it gives you a list of of of, uh, of plants, and they separate them by growth habit. So you have a section for trees, one for shrubs, one for grasses, one for wildflowers, one for vines. Um, and those again, you know, in the same vein as before, these are these are species that historically would have been found in your area. And if your goal is to recreate a pocket of habitat, to restore a pocket of habitat, uh, this really is your your best bet to uh, to get started. So I, I very highly recommend using this um, this website for for research. Uh, once you get your plant list, you can click on any of the uh, the plant species, and it takes you to another page that gives you a ton of information. Uh, about the plant, you know, what soils it, it, it likes, uh, what kind of light requirements it needs, you know, what, what kind of watering uh, you, need to, you need to give it, and also things like ecology. Um, so just kind of different fun facts about the plant. Uh, so this is a very excellent resource. Um, step four, you want to create your site plan and your plant list. So you can either do that yourself you know, you can hire a professional who's going to give you a really nice looking schematic of, 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 uh, of how your landscape might be if you want to just take a hands off approach on it. Or you can just grab a pen and paper and start drawing. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's no one way of, of creating a site plan, but it is an important step. Um, uh, and that, of course, is, is because, you know, you, like I mentioned before, because you have different parameters um, that you need to consider within, a, within any landscape, you want to make sure that you're putting the right plant in the right place. Um, and of course, this photo here in the top right shows 
a plant that arguably is in the wrong space. You have what looks like a, like a live oak tree, which turns into a really, really large tree over the years. You have it hugging this, uh, this wall of this, of this building that's right next to it. Um, and and you, you do see that all the time. Um, you know, if you, if you drive around, around Miami, you see trees that are planted just way too close to a, to a building or some kind of structure. Um, so you want to put in the right amount of research and you want to you want to know how big a plant's going to get, their lighting requirements, their soil requirements, um, and then you want to make a kind of schematic on, on where the best place to put them is uh, based on the space and the lighting and all those things. Um, and there's a lot to choose from. For anyone who says, you know, I don't, I don't plant natives because there's just not a lot to choose from. South Florida has, has a, a little over 1,500 native plant species, so there's a huge palette of plants to, to choose from. Um, something else to keep in mind uh, when you're landscaping, of course, you want to be respectful. So there's an acronym called uh, called BRASH, um, and the and it stands for uh, for these things here. Uh, so border, you know, making things look intentional, and borders go a long way in in, uh, in in doing that. So having a border that kind of delineates where where your plantings are uh, to make it look uh, nice and tidy and intentional. Uh, recognize the rights of others. You know, if you have a neighbor right next to you and you have a live oak you want to plant, you know, you might give it ample space with your house, but you don't want to plant it right next to theirs. You want to be respectful. Um, advertise, uh, those are things like those, those, uh, those signs that I had in, in, the, in the photo uh, of my landscape a couple of uh, slides ago, you know, advertising that you have native plants and what the utility is and try and get people's attention. Uh, start small, uh, so start with a, with a handful of plants and, and, and then build from there. Um, and humanize, you know, make the landscape inviting both for, for wildlife, of course, for wildlife, that's, that's one of the main goals here, um, but also make it inviting for people, make it somewhere that they want to enjoy and they want to hang around. Step five would be to acquire your plants, and there's many places you can get them. Um, of course, you know, your first thought would be to find a local uh, native plant nursery, um, and to that end, you could use uh, these two um, uh, first uh, uh, um, uh, organizations to, 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 to look for native uh, uh, plant nurseries. So there's the Florida Association of Native Nurseries, which if you go on their website, you can just type your location and it gives you a list of, um, of nurseries in your area. Uh, or you can type the name of a specific plant species and you can find local nurseries that, that have it in stock. Um, plant Ant is a similar, uh, similar resource to, to FAN, um, but I think it, it's not Florida specific. I think, I think it's, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's, it's countrywide. Um, I highly recommend checking out the Fairchild Connect to Protect Network. Um, so that's a program within Fairchild uh, where they, they're trying to encourage homeowners to build uh, uh, you know, small patches of, of pine rockland ecosystem, which of course um, are, are, are becoming, have become very rare over the decades and, and becoming even rarer still. Uh, and they, they distribute free plants. If you sign up for the Connect to Protect Network, they'll give you, um, I think, up to five free plants. And, and every so often, you can come back to, uh, to get more. So it's a great way to get um, not only free plants, but of species that are, that are pretty rare. You know, they grow a lot of things that you might not find otherwise. Um, I, I definitely cannot uh, miss mentioning our, 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 uh, the Dade Chapter Native Plant Society plant raffle. So we have a monthly meeting. Uh, for most months of the year, they happen on the fourth uh, Tuesday of, of, of most months, um, and they happen at Pinecrest Garden, so they're in-person meetings. Um, uh, and when we have those in-person meetings, we have a native plant raffle table. So, so folks who come to the meetings, they, they donate some plants, and then we raffle them uh, out to, to anyone who wants to, um, uh, to purchase some tickets. Um, and I've, I've gotten plenty of plants from the raffle table. It's, it's, a, it's a really, it's really marvelous to see what, what, uh, what people donate. Um, and, and sometimes you see some really rare things come up at the, on the table. Uh, it's very important to, to know that you do not have to put all the plants in the ground at the same time. And it's often not possible. You know, if you have your plant list, um, it, it might be the case that you can't find them all the time, uh, that, that you can't find them all at the same time rather. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, you can start small. You can put, you can, you can plant a small patch in your, in your landscape and you can go from there. Um, and that's, that's, that's what I've done at home. You know, the, the, what I have here is still a work in progress and, and uh, it's, it's been a, it's been a, a, a bit, you know, an effort that's, that, that's gone bit by bit. Um, and it also lets you create a story with your landscape. So, 
you know, if you're waiting to get your plants little by little, you know, you're going to get them from different sources, whether you buy them from someone or someone gave you seeds and you grew it yourself or a close friend donated some plants to you um, as a gift. So each, each plant has its own story. So it, it, it kind of, it kind of uh, forms this, this, um, this tapestry of, of a story, you know, if, uh, within, within your, your landscape, um, just, just based off, you know, where, where you got all the, all the plants from. Uh, step six is to prep your, uh, your planting area. Um, of course, if you're intending to convert a piece of lawn into a native landscape, you want to remove the lawn. If you try and plant native plants just, you know, amongst all the grasses and, you know, potentially non-native weeds and things like that, you're, you, you know, just from my own personal experience, a lot of the time uh, you, you end up losing plants, you know, especially since you need to keep the lawn tidy and, and mow. Uh, that's not to say that you can't have lawns that, that have a good amount of native species. Um, in, in fact, we, we just had a presentation uh, a couple months ago about just that, the utility of, of lawns in native landscaping. Uh, but if you have, if you're trying to create, you know, something, something really tidy or, or have something become really showy, um, a, a good amount of the time, you know, a lawn, a lawn might, might, uh, might, might, you might wanna make a decision on, on whether you wanna remove um, lawn, lawn grass. Uh, Weeding is a very important thing. So, so just ripping out uh, unwanted plants from the, from the soil, uh, depending on what kind of soil you're working with um, and the kinds of plants you wanna put in, you might wanna do, uh, make a soil amendment. So adding maybe some organic matter into the, into the soil so that it can support certain plants. Um, now, I know herbicides and fertilizers can be very useful tools. I, I try to, you know, I, I, I in general shy away from them. Um, because I don't want to unintentionally uh, uh, introduce any chemicals into the soil that can that can you know change the ecology of the place uh, you know of, of the soil you know kill all the all the all the uh, life within the ground itself or potentially you know have some residue um, that can that can get you know onto some insect that's eaten by some bird and then suddenly the bird's feeling sick. Um, but I know that that you know sometimes it's unavoidable to use to use these things. Um, I, I just uh, recommend using them as a, as a um, you know, using them not right off the bat. So, so, so uh, really, really considering the decision to use, to use chemicals um, only if it's absolutely necessary. Just, just my two cents on it. Uh, then it's planting time. Once you've gotten your plants, it's time to put them in the ground. Um, now, when you buy a, a plant or if you acquire a plant, of course, it's most likely going to be in a pot. And most pots are circular in shape. So if you, you know, a lot of the times when you when you purchase a plant from from a nursery and you take it out of the pot, you notice that it has a lot of these circling roots, um, especially if it's been inside that pot for for a long time. Now a lot of people just get that plant and they put it in the soil without doing anything to the roots. Um, but what's going to happen is that because those roots are already going in circles, they're going to continue going around and around and around. Uh, that that uh, what's called the, the root ball. Um, and, and they're not going to send roots outwards. You know, they're not going to send lateral roots, which of course they get their stability from. So when you take a plant out of the pot, first thing you want to do is kind of break apart the roots um, and to, to, to encourage that lateral growth. So you want to you want to try and tease apart these circling roots so they go outwards rather than continuing the circle. Um, and then there's proper planting techniques. So there are ways to plant something that can ensure the death of your plant. So you want to you want to make sure that you uh, that you plant it in such a way that you ensure the the, the survivability of your plant. Um, and the way to do that, and that's especially relevant for things like trees and shrubs. Uh, you know, you might be able to get away with with um, with herbaceous plants, so things like grasses and wildflowers. Uh, but for trees and shrubs, this becomes very important. So when you take the plant out of the pot you wanna find what's called the trunk flare, which is where the trunk makes a 90 degree angle and becomes the roots. So that's called the trunk flare or also called the root flare. Um, and that, that trunk flare is, you're gonna want it to be um, at level with the rest of the soil. So if you put it too deep, uh, it's gonna to get too much water. So you're gonna have part of the trunk getting too much water and that can lead to, um, uh, to the trunk uh, rotting, which of course will kill the plant. And if you plant it too high up, it's going to have too much drainage. So it's not going to get enough water 
and you might have the case where the tree the tree dies. Um, so so having it level with everything else is very important. Uh, you want a hole that's two to three times the diameter of the root ball. Uh, when you put the soil back after putting the uh, the tree in the ground, you want to make sure you're lightly patting the soil around the uh, the tree just to kind of get rid of any air pockets so that the tree doesn't lean uh, over time. Um, and then a lot of people like to add mulch, both to act as a, um, a way to retain moisture, especially important for new plants, uh, but also to, to show uh, uh, anyone who's going to do maintenance in that area that there's a tree there. You do not want to take a mower or a weed whacker uh, anywhere near the tree. So if you have a good layer of mulch um, circling around the tree in a donut, you, don't, you definitely don't want to put mulch all along the base of the trunk in what's called a, a volcano. Uh, because that's just going to lead to too much too much moisture retention um, and and can also lead to the trunk rotting. But um, but mulch definitely definitely is a helpful tool. All right, and then after you put your plants in the ground, you know you've made your plan, you've got your plants, they're in the ground. Maintenance is going to be a perpetual thing, and that's that's true for native planting areas. That's true for non-native planting areas. It's just a fact of life um, for having plants. Uh, around you in your landscape. Although in general, for a lot of, for a lot of things, native plants require a little less maintenance um, than, than, uh, than non-native plants. Uh, in particular, for, for fertilization um, and for how much water you need to, to give them. You know, because native plants evolved here over thousands of years, um, they've, they've, they're, they're used to the nutrient profiles of our soil. So you, you are very, likely not to ever need to, to put any uh, fertilizer in the soil for them. Um, and, and on the same token, because they've evolved here over thousands of years, they've also uh, learned to cope with our water regime. So, so how much water, you know, how much rainfall we get on a yearly basis. So once you have a plant uh, uh, in the ground for the first few weeks, you want to water it because it's a new plant. It's had some root disturbance. It, it needs some, some extra water to put out new roots. But in general, once a native plant is established in the landscape, you know, once it's been there for a few weeks or a few months, usually you don't ever have to water it again. Um, of course, you know, there are some, some things like, like wetland plants, you know, you might create a little pocket of wetlands that might need a bit more water, but usually once a native plant's established, you're good to go. Uh, keeping weeds at bay is going to be a perpetual thing. You know, you have things pop up all the time. Um, there are plenty of non-native weeds. And there are plenty of, of, uh, of native plants that, that a lot of people would argue need to be maintained in the, um, in the landscape. Uh, and everyone has their own, their own viewpoints on that. I personally do find myself uh, uh, weeding out even, even certain native species at home because they, they just grow so prolifically that if I, I didn't, if I didn't remove them, I would lose a lot of these rarer plants um, that are much harder to, to, to get. But it's all about balance. You know, there's, there's, there's nothing, there's no good or bad players here. It's about keeping everything in, in balance. Um, and then of course, enjoy your landscape. You know, you spend so much time planning it. You spent so much time, um, uh, you know, getting the plants and putting them in the ground and taking care of them. You got to just enjoy it. Uh, you know, and that could be just sitting outside with a, with a cup of coffee and a pair of binoculars and seeing birds and butterflies come by and, 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 and just enjoying the, the wildlife that, uh, that, that comes to your home. You know, there's, there's so many benefits, you know, not just ecological, like, like I've mentioned throughout the presentation, but there's so many benefits to, to, um, to just personal enjoyment uh, uh, with native landscaping. You get a really profound sense of accomplishment um, and, a, and a really big sense of, of place uh, when, when you add uh, native plants to the landscape. You're, you're, you're getting the true character of your land and establishing it in your immediate environment. And I think that's a very profound, profound thing. So just a few resources uh, to point out to you guys. Um, so of course, I, I, uh, I, I definitely have to mention um, uh, the Florida Native Plant Society, especially our local chapter, which is the Dade chapter. Uh, here's a link to both the Dade chapter's website and to the, uh, the statewide organization. Um, if you're tuning in from from uh, other counties, uh, you know there's, you know, you're bound to have your own local Native Plant Society chapter, which I highly encourage uh, everyone to uh, to look at, especially if you have an interest uh, in this topic. Um, you know, our main goal is to protect uh, and preserve our native plants and 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 uh, and, and native ecosystems. 
um, and we can't do that without without the support from others. Um, I, I recommend the Atlas of Florida Plants, which is a big database for all of uh, all of uh, Florida. Um, has a lot of really good pictures. North American Butterfly Association, Miami Blue Chapter, which is more geared uh, towards butterflies, and they 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 have a lot of articles um, about native plants and and butterflies. If that's your main goal, uh, the University of Florida IFAS Extension is a wealth of of knowledge uh, when it comes to to, uh, to ecosystems, you know, also throughout the state. Uh, Fairchild Connect to Protect, as I mentioned before. Uh, Bound by Beauty, which is another local organization which, which uh, tries to uh, encourage folks uh, to, to attract um, uh, butterflies to, to their yard. Uh, and, and, and they try to build an appreciation of nature. Uh, and lastly, Citizens for a Better South Florida. If you go to the website, they have a, a Go Native um, a part of their website. Uh, and, and Citizens uh, for a Better South Florida really tries to, uh, to help particularly um, underserved communities in, in Miami. So they're trying to, uh, to bring this, this message to, um, to folks in, in, in underserved parts of the, of the community. Uh, and if you have any direct questions to me, this is my email. So that's briandiaz1210 at gmail.com. And now that you guys are all experts on native plants, we have our, uh, our quiz again. So these are the same questions that you saw before, and I'll give you guys a minute to answer. Oh, and please scroll all the way to the bottom. There is a fourth question. All right, and it looks like we have 100% answered. So uh, let's just go over them for the first one. Um, oh, well, it seems that there's more answers coming in. I'll give a few more seconds. <laughs> oh, I see there's two percentages here. Brian, you're fine to go ahead and start sharing the answers. All right, sounds good. Um, so how many native plant species are there in South Florida? There are 1,500. There's quite a few uh, species, and there's even more if you consider Central and North Florida. Um, question two, true or false, landscaping with a small handful of native plant species is just as beneficial for wildlife as landscaping with many species. Um, and the answer for that, I, I would argue, is, is false. Uh, and the reason for that is because, you know, as I mentioned before, the more biodiversity you have in general, the more native wildlife diversity you're going to attract at home. If you have many butterfly host plants, you're going to get many species of butterflies. If you have one species of butterfly host plant, you're most likely to just get that one butterfly at home. Um, and then which of the following is true? Uh, most of you uh, correctly answered that one. So habitat loss and fragmentation and invasive species um, are the biggest detriments to, uh, to, to biodiversity loss. Um, so I think, uh, I think I did see some improvement in, in, these, uh, in these questions. So uh, great job, everyone. All right. So I'd like to thank everyone for, uh, for, for joining. Um, and, and for, for lending your, your listening ears, and I'd be happy to take a couple of questions if there's still time. <laughs>